Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Uh, our guests today are Mark uh, Darienzo, uh, who is the co-chair of the Climate Jobs PDX uh, organization, and with him is Joanna Kirchhoff, uh, who is a member of Climate Jobs PDX. So welcome to the show. Thank, oh, thank you. you. Good, good. good. <laughs> yeah, so uh, tell me, about the founding of the organization and the purpose of the organization. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll do that. Um, it, it w uh, Climate Jobs PDX was started by a group of activists who originally were with Jobs with Justice. And they were concerned about climate change, and also the lack of living wage jobs. And the biggest issue, I think, was the tension between labor and environmentalists that was um, detrimental to both groups and really detrimental to getting anything uh, moving down the down the highway f for change. So um, it now we um, have a lot of retired members from unions. I think almost everyone in the group is a retired union member. Um, but we also have a lot of connections with um, other groups like 350 PDX and CR Club, East Side Democratic Club. And um, the focus has always been bringing the labor perspective into the groups that in, we are into associated the into groups. the environmental groups mm -hmm. and bringing environmental mm -hmm. groups into meetings so that labor has a platform mm -hmm. and labor feels supported instead of attacked. So um, we um, have done some programs. We brought um, Naomi Klein was here, and we all went and talked to her, and we did some book studies around Naomi Klein. And she's the author of. She's uh, uh, this. This the, changes everything. Yeah, this changes everything. The, the ultimate <coughs> why unions need to join the climate fight. That's one of the things that uh, got people excited. Um, we also brought um, Joe Uline, who um, is the creator of um, the. Um, see, let, let me. I want to say this correctly. Mm -hmm. So the Labor Network for Sustainability. Mm -hmm. And he has <coughs> published um, a couple of documents about clean energy future. Um, and his work especially, he's uh, also an entertainer. So when he came to town last time, we had him um, do a musical performance. And then there was a lecture. And then there was a really great session where environmentalists and um, people from the union sat down and talked to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so he talks a lot about just transition, which is one of the things that we've been working on since the inception, I think, wouldn't you agree? It's You're been pretty one close, of the, yes. Pretty close to the inception, right? And um, I l really like the way Joe Uline talked about it. He talked about the fact that um, unions need to join into the movement for renewable and sustainable energy. Otherwise, they'll get left behind like they have before when, when uh, the economics have changed, he'll, they'll get left behind. And he actually called it roadkill. They will become roadkill mm -hmm. on, on the, way to <laughs> the way to the future. So, um, so, so uh, sorry, yeah, so w w when, when you say they would become roadkill, you mean their organizations would become roadkill. Right. Obviously, labor is always going to be involved. Well, <clears throat> I think the not. best example was the coal miners. I mean, for me, you mm -hmm. jump in if you okay. have. But I think they're a great example in that um, their industry is, is disappearing. And, or the loggers here in Oregon, that would mm -hmm. be another example, where their industry changed. And what they needed was a just transition as they moved away from those traditional jobs. They needed support in um, retraining and, and uh, some ideas about becoming entrepreneurs or just creating some new way to sustain themselves. Mm -hmm. And the union mm -hmm. needed to step in and do that. But then the environmentalists um, also needed to step in. And they're stepping in now to talk about a just transition where people aren't left behind. Mm -hmm. And then traditionally, it's been um, the, com the communities of color and low income communities that have suffered most and are still suffering from climate change and from the, those changes. So the unions have become more and more aware of those groups when they mm -hmm. um, work for their new contracts. Because actually, a union job is the model for what a, a good job is. Mm -hmm. It has a living oh, wage, yeah. mm -hmm. has health benefits, it has mm -hmm. support system where mm -hmm. if there are changes, there's a group of people to support you. Mm -hmm. And okay. move forward. All right. yeah. So you've used the phrase "just transition" just several transition. times. So elaborate on on what what is, what is that? What well, 
What does a that mean? As I understand, well, here, here's, can, do you mind if I read? I know no, it's... No, uh, okay, okay, go ahead. It says, it's a framework for looking at how environmental and climate justice can address long-standing economic inequality, bringing all movements for justice under a single unified frame, coming together to make all the voices heard. So that's, that's where labor and low income and people of color and environmentalists and all those people come together looking for a way to move into the new economy because without leaving without people leaving behind. people yeah, behind exactly, yeah. and mm -hmm. and without leaving them with substandard non-living wage jobs mm -hmm. because okay. that that happens often Sometimes and joe uline was talking about right. the roadkill because it's going to move in that direction. You know, the new economy is moving, solar is getting increasing, wind power is increasing, and it's moving in that direction. A lot of jobs, alternate transportations, it's moving there, and if unions do not get on board, then they can be hurt by it, and that's really, I mm -hmm. think, what he's getting at. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. And, and, and so, so how, how did you, uh, Mark, get involved with this particular organization? I was one of the early founders, and Dave King, came up to me and said, Mark, you know, climate change is a really big issue. We need to get things going again. We had uh, started one time many, many years ago around climate change, and then that kind of went by the wayside. But then they said, we'd really got to meet again and start talking to unions about this. And so he approached me and said, do you want to get to start doing this? So we contacted some people we knew, and we had a lot of, we had interest, and that's how the group got started, and that's how I got involved okay. at the beginning. And, and so, your membership of the of the of the group itself is primarily union people. I'd say mostly. The the planning membership when we have events, um, I actually have mm. more contacts with the environmental movement myself. So mm -hmm. then they they are, have started coming to our meetings also, mm -hmm. like the Center for Sustainable Economics, comes sometimes, yes. and we've had speakers and. Um, since we started working on community solar, we've had a l we've worked with a lot of different groups. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. Great. So yeah, one 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 of the things I wanted to, uh, yeah. to talk about certainly was community solar. But before we get to that, okay. what other kind of programs do you have going on? Um, well, we we um, participate in a lot of different activities, mostly to make sure that labor's voice is heard in the discussion, because. Um, like this, uh, 350, the Sierra Club, I think I mentioned them. Um, I'm part of the Raging Grannies, which means that we're out there at, mm. at a lot of different mm -hmm. events. Mm -hmm. And so when, mm -hmm. and, and realized that we needed to be out there at labor events also, mm -hmm. that we needed to make that connection. Um, see, what else? The, uh, five, the rally at 557. Right. The, the uh, new legislation. Yeah, we've been, we go and a uh, lobby, we lobby. Um, down in Salem. Down in Salem. Sorry, we did lobby mm -hmm. down in Salem. We go. Actually, we're in City Hall a lot here. Mm -hmm. So, um, but one of the issues has always been um, that we want to work carefully with the Labor Council, and so there's a really delicate balance that we find uh, um, ourselves sustaining because. Not all the unions are as excited about the transitions. Mm -hmm. That's pretty. And so, um, <laughs> even sometimes when we go and present to them, it can be um, tense. Mm -hmm. So we try to be there as a voice, but we don't always go as a group with our with our uh, signage and all our literature because we don't mm -hmm. want to lose that good connection that we have with labor so because mm -hmm. we support them mm -hmm. and that's the whole idea mm -hmm. is to support them to support both sides and to make it yeah. a really yeah. good connection and any way we can promote jobs like with this 557 there's a job component to it it's a I can't remember the legislation that it's a um, clean energy legislation that's going through the, right, the like pipeline cap and invest, cap and, invest. Cap and, and so invest, that can right. create a lot of jobs and so we support that and so we don't oppose jobs in any sector but we keep on promoting and pushing jobs in the new economy because it's going to be. We feel there's going to be quite a few, and that's why we, you know, keep on telling unions that, we, you know, you, this is an opportunity to get on board and become part of that new job economy. Uh, that I guess you could say the green economy. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay, all right. So, so t t talk talk about this community solar. The community okay. solar was a bill that was introduced into the Oregon legislature, what? It was last session? year, okay. and it got passed. It was part of a, a larger package, but it was passed, 
It was Senate Bill 1547. And right now the Public Utility Commission is drafting rules to implement the provisions of that community solar program. And they got input from a lot of stakeholders. The, the power companies are there, uh, three, uh, PGE, Pacific Power, and Idaho Power, because they have a little chunk of Oregon, mm -hmm. in Eastern Oregon. And then there's a lot of stakeholders. We're part of that. We go to the meetings and we provide input. And the first draft is due out in April uh, to really, uh, so people can really, you know, they, we've been providing a lot of input through, been going through many workshops. There's been quite a few workshops where they're, the PUC is trying to get some input before they start writing the rules so they can kind of cater it to, uh, to the different uh, stakeholders. Okay. So that's going to come out probably out in April. And, um, and the, I'm sorry, the PUC is? PUC, the, the, the draft rule is going to come out in April. And the PUC year. stands for? A Public Utility Commission. Okay, thanks. All right. yeah. okay. And so what we're trying to do is, um, um, okay, that's what's happening as far as where the, the, the legislation is and where the, the rules and regulations are going to be coming out. So there's going to be an opportunity for people to comment on those draft rules when they come out in April as well. And, but basically the community solar program is a chance for Oregonians to join in and invest in solar power who maybe can't purchase it on their own for various reasons or lease it. And one of the reasons why they can't is they're renters. Another reason is they're homeowners, but the roof is not oriented in the right direction. It's covered by trees or uh, the roof may not be solid enough to put panels on it. So it allows this, these people to invest in solar power and without having to put the, the panels on their roof. Mm. And so at least in part, it's a way of getting people yes. who otherwise might support solar, right. but can't exactly. uh, actually do it themselves right. and right. to get them involved. Yes, in, in, involved and also uh, get some benefit from that. Mm -hmm. And before I get into the benefits, uh, there's a low income component. In other words, 10% of the total generating capacity of the projects have to go toward low income customers of PG&E. And the location of the project can be anywhere within the state, but the customers are within the three, you know, those utilities, PGE, Pacific Power, and Idaho Power, so they have to be in their territory, okay. service territory. So those are the privately owned those investor Those are the privately owned, owned investor owned right, companies. Yeah, yeah. So it really doesn't involve like Eugene Water and Electric Board, they are not in it. They may have their own community solar program, but this community solar program is designed to be in those territories. Mm -hmm. And the project, I think they so the project can be no smaller than 25 kilowatts. And so that could be on a big roof, or it could be on property in Eastern Oregon, for example, uh, that, you know, they have a lot of land, they have a lot of sun. And in fact, uh, there's one program I was reading about in Crook County, they're digging, they're starting to break ground for a 56, 56 megawatt project in Crook County that could, they say, the, the company is, that's working on it, that could uh, power 9,000 homes and employ about 300 jobs at the peak of the construction. Mm -hmm. So they're starting to do these outside of the community solar program. Now the benefits of the program here is that, of course, people are going to have reduction in their energy bills. That's one of the big incentives. The other is that more people can take part in solar be part of the solar revolution, and also that the more solar panels in the state, the more solar power, the less reliance on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And of course, the job creation aspect, which we're excited about, uh, you know, jobs are gonna be created, and the more solar panels you put within the state, the bigger the program, the more there's gonna be jobs within that sector. And um, so that's why we're excited about it. In fact, we wrote a letter and I'd like to read some of the parts of the letter that mm -hmm. we submitted. And one, uh, and th it was this went to who? Letter to the Pu uh, Public Utility Commission okay. in support of community solar. Mm -hmm. And so we felt that in our letter, we said that the project should adhere to high labor standards, use high quality materials, the workforce should be well qualified and highly trained, workers should be receiving prevailing wages as well as good quality pension and health benefits, the company should demonstrate during the pre-certification process that they, adhere, that they adhere to these standards. And not only should low-income citizens be able to invest in the solar projects, but low-income citizens should be also, be also be trained and employed to work in the solar industry. And companies with minority or women ownership 
should be encouraged to win contracts building and developing solar projects. So we try to get it from the labor point of view that this, and the equity, equity point of view, that it's fun to build these projects, but you really have to bring on board people who will benefit from the projects and you know, have a high standard of lift for labor that people are knowing they're going to be able to get good paying jobs with good benefits. Mm -hmm. So that was our comments to them. Now this project, there's been a lot of workshops and a lot of different points of view on directions of the program, but I think we f tried to focus on the jobs aspect with our letter. And we got IBEW 48 to sign on to that letter. IBEW. I, I, that's International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, 48, mm -hmm. to sign on to that letter. And then we also have been talking to the trade councils to get their support. And we, uh, they seemed interested, but we don't know if they're going to support it or not, mm -hmm. you know, as far as uh, providing comments to the PUC to also focus on high labor standards. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's yeah. really the program in a nutshell. And there's a lot of, uh, we're all interested in seeing what the Public Utility Commission comes out as far as their rules, because they're getting a lot of input from power companies, from uh, energy groups, oh, the list is endless, the Renewable Northwest, uh, Bonneville Energy Environmental Foundation, the Oregon Solar Industries Association is weighing in, the City of Portland, Multnomah County, Sustainable Northwest, uh, Community Action Partnerships, uh, Community Energy Projects, and they deal with weatherization. So a lot of different groups are weighing in mm -hmm. to this process. And so yeah. it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of it. Yeah, and it, it sounds from th that list you just read mm -hmm. that uh, many of them might be more interested in lowering uh, labor standards rather than increasing them. Well, I don't, well, some of them are, well, those organizations are nonprofits, they're interested in getting energy, and I think that, uh, I know that there's one group, Northwest uh, Sustainable Energy for Economic Development, they supported our letter. Mm -hmm. So we wanted everybody to support that letter, but no one, we didn't get enough, we got some support, but I don't think that in all, there's a consortium of these groups, except for the power companies, that meet because we want to make it equitable. We want to make this program designed to do what it said it's going to do, be community solar. So I'm thinking, I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak for them, but I think that these organizations would support us in providing you know, decent jobs for people. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're, the power companies I kind of see as they may have problems with it. Uh, yes, that's, that's who I was thinking about. Okay, <laughs> yeah, but all these other groups, these other yeah. groups, right. you know, they, uh, their goal is to bring alternative energy right. mm -hmm. and get that moving, mm -hmm. and they all support that. But the utility companies, they want to see it, but they have different agendas, and um, mm -hmm. right. like, Although, for example, the size of the, you know, the size of the, the size, the size you know, there's a program size, and there's a pro each project size. There's a minimum, but we haven't, there's been some contention about how big the, each project should be. Also, the actual program cap, the whole program, should there be a cap? And our contention, the consortium's contention, is there should be no cap. There should be as much solar out there as, as mm -hmm. people want, mm -hmm. and, and companies can, you know, the, the people who are going to be putting it up want. I think Minnesota had no cap, and they got overwhelmed with requests from people who wanted to be part of that kind of overwhelmed them, they really, uh, no. <laughs> you know, too much. Uh -huh. They didn't realize how much interest there was in this program. So we kind of see the same thing, because about 40 or 50 percent of households cannot, are not good for solar. Mm -hmm. And of course, all the renters out there. Uh, yeah, right, yeah. So, so you said Minnesota? Yeah, Minnesota, Colorado, uh, New York, they all have these community solar programs. Oh, okay. And they, they're the ones, the ones that have been fairly successful. And, and, and they're at a more developed state than yeah, we are. No, they're starting, they're starting. We're they're developing actually, it. Mm -hmm. And there's other uh, states that are developing it along with us and other states that are more advanced. Mm -hmm. right. But okay. we did go to Salem. They did have a hearing and there was, the hearing room was full, the overflow room was full, and they added another overflow oh, wow. room. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of interest. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we've been talking about is as it, as it, gets a little more solidified so that we can actually go out with talking points. One of the things that we'd like to do is actually go out into the community and talk to people in the community and let, because mm. I, I ha have mm. a feeling that there are a lot of low income houses, households that just don't know oh, that sure. is coming down the pipeline. Right. Yeah, and they yeah. need, yeah. really they need one-on-one -on -one contact. Yeah, they don't know. Well, the, uh, yeah. There was a group that went out in, to different parts of Oregon to talk about it. It was a road show and uh, I didn't go. They had uh, one in Portland and one in uh, Eastern Oregon and one in 
along the coast. They had different road shows. They tried to explain, and they did get input from uh, the community there, and they did. But they're going to have to really have a, a really good PR campaign. Once the rules are finalized, right. mm -hmm. then we have to get the word out that this is happening, and to get enough owners or subscribers to take part in the program, mm -hmm. which means that they're going to be developing a lot more. If they can get a bunch of people knowing they're going to be having some a base of support, there's going to be more projects out there. So right. PR is going to be key. Okay, right. yeah. And do you know if the regional legislation that authorized the community solar program, did it include funding for PR work, or, or do you know? Uh, it didn't really have a funding yeah, it aspect of it. It hasn't moved that far to oh, okay. committee yet. No, it yeah. really hasn't. It didn't talk about funding. It didn't talk about oh, funding Oh, I see. Yet. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. But, uh, you know, of course, when they, they roll it out, I, I really don't know how they're going to work it. Now, they, they got to figure out a project manager, too, who's going to who, who's going to manage these projects. And a lot of people like the Energy Trust of Oregon as a project mm -hmm. manager. Mm -hmm. And, and other people think, well, we just put it out for bid, and whoever we get, you know, the, the best group that you get to, to manage right. all these projects within the state. Because it's multi, you know, you have the customers and subscribers, you have the utility companies, you have the uh, the companies that are going to run the project, put the uh, solar panels in, and then you have the project managers. So you have a lot of moving parts. Right. Yeah. But okay. this is a, this is really the point where labor needs to be there. I mean, they, labor mm -hmm. really needs to be at the table talking mm -hmm. about yeah. the jobs that will be created, so that there'll be labor jobs and. Mm -hmm and have those high standards in. Yeah. And then the labor community will get excited and then there'll be subscribers. Yeah. yeah. So are, are, are there um, solar training l labor programs in Oregon? Uh, there are, mm -hmm. and uh, not from totally from, I know the uh, like brothers, the electrical, the electrical workers, workers, they have yeah. a, a program. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in fact, uh, I know that um, I went on the Oregon uh, Building Council uh, website and they talk about alternative energies and their so they support that, they work that, and so there's a lot of, there's training out there. Mm -hmm. But I think there should be more. Mm -hmm. right. But that there is training, and electrical workers do have training. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know in general that, you know, there, there are apprentice programs out, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but it seems like as we move forward and we get more jobs and, you know, there is not enough actual skilled workers to do the, right. to do right. the job, so I'm hoping that. Right. Uh, apprentice programs mm -hmm. and training programs will be right. on the agenda. Right, and women in trades uh, women in tra are right, starting yeah, right. uh, up. They have a program I used to teach, and so I used to take, uh, go with the middle schoolers to uh, a day every year where they wa they had displays and they had hands-on um, uh, centers so you could uh, do carpentry, so you could drive the heavy, so you could go up the poles like a utility worker, and the and the school kids loved it. So mm -hmm. they're starting it again, and I'm sure that solar will be wrapped in there. So oh, okay. they're going to start reaching out again mm -hmm. to to um, women, to young girls especially in the uh, high schools. To, right. for women yeah, to is uh, Madeline Elder still? still there. She is. She is still, still there, there and yeah. doing a great yeah. job. I'm doing of a great job. Yeah. yeah, of course she was. She was head of uh, the Communication Workers of America, local, 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 yeah. uh, for quite a long time. So yes, right, yeah. yeah. No, it's, I'm really yeah. excited that it's coming back. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah, it's Madeline's a been, a, been a guest on our program, oh, although right. it's been a few years. So. All right. Yeah, so, uh, four minutes. Uh, okay. are, are you promoting any specific legislation now? In, in it's uh, uh, was it five five seven? Yeah, it's it's SB five five seven. That's okay. the one we were talking about. That's the cap and invest. Okay. So, um, we're so that would cap carbon emissions and cap carbon emissions. It's it's similar to the program that they're using in California, uh -huh. um, and California has used the invest part of it really successfully and they've um, people are are uh, behind the program there hasn't been a lot of complaint from the constituents and then there's also I don't know as much about it but I know there's a bill uh, about diesel oh, yes. out there so capping the emissions from diesel yeah. which is another climate but then but because it's going to affect all the people in the unions all the truck drivers all the mechanics so once again they need to be informed they mm -hmm. need to know it's coming down the road and their unions need to be ready to step in with some new training and it would be great if they would support it mm -hmm. yeah the cap and invest is the key one because they they right. talk about putting money into creating jobs 
Right. And so that's that's where the well, way we support it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. All right. Yeah. And, and this diesel line is important because both Washington and California have uh, standards about right. vehicles mm -hmm. and how much diesel pollutants they can right. spew, and mm -hmm. Oregon does not. Right. So. And even <laughs> Ted Wheeler at his town hall <laughs> mentioned the right, fact that did. we've become the dumping grounds yeah. for all the old mm -hmm. trucks that uh -huh. no longer meet the standards right. in the other two states. Mm -hmm. So right. they are now driving our roads and, uh, yes. and polluting our air. Uh, right. and, 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 and our lungs. And our lungs. And then also one of the things um, that he mentioned was that a lot of the diesel pollution is from construction. Mm -hmm. It's those generators, generators the yeah. big generators, oh, yeah. and so. But but then again, it's a time. The unions will need to start looking at the fact that they're going to have to get behind it and support climate and mm -hmm. so climate change. And but mm -hmm. it's a big investment for them to mm -hmm. change over to you know a whole different set of equipment mm -hmm. that's less polluting. Okay. So and if they want to know more about the community, so this want to get to before the time. Yeah. Yeah. they can just contact me or Joanna. Right. And we'd be able to let them know if they want to send comments in. We'll give them the address, phone numbers of the P, uh, the Pub Portland U Public Utility Commission. Oh yeah. And there's still a lot of time for comment before they submit the draft. And then once they submit the draft, there'll be a comment period on okay. the draft itself. And w when, when is the draft supposed uh, to? They're submitted? supposed to come out in April. I'm not sure in when, April. but okay. uh, April is their official right. designated time, sometime in April, mid-April, uh -huh. I think. Okay. Right. And, All right. and you can find us on the internet at Climate Jobs PDX. Mm -hmm. Just put that in and it'll take you. Okay. And then um, there's also another program out there if people want to look it up. up it's called or Oregon Just Transition Alliance. So there's a new alliance, um, um, in Environmental Justice Oregon, Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, Beyond Toxic, Pineros and Campesinos del Noroeste, uh, the Rural Organizing Project, and Unite Oregon. So, and it's you can look it up at Opal, O P A L P D X dot org. Okay. So that's another Opal. place if if people are interested in just transition okay. and promoting jobs for the future and mm -hmm. a cleaner environment. Yeah. Those are some places they okay. can go Excellent. and get some Excellent information. information. All okay. right, good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you both very oh, much for being you. on the program. I really appreciate it you being here. Okay, well, thank you. Thank okay. you. Fine. Thanks Great. for inviting good. us. Good, good. Okay. Yeah. So this has been Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our guests today have been Mark Dallorenzo, who is the co-chair of the Climate Jobs PDX, and Joanna Kirchhoff. Good job, Close. Okay, coffee. great. Uh, <laughs> who is a member of uh, Climate uh, Jobs PDX. So okay. uh, I hope that you'll join us again next week. Bye. <laughs>